and then we'll we'll get started. So welcome everybody. If you're joining us, we're just upgrading for the signal to say that we are live. And as I say those very words, I have got that signal. So um, thank you all very much indeed for joining us today. Um, we are very pleased to have people following us from a wide variety of different countries uh, with particularly strong representation uh, from the US. Uh, the point of today's event is to present uh, some of the headline findings from two separate and distinct research studies uh, that we have been involved in with partners uh, in the UK and in the US. Both studies are in the process of being completed, uh, but we thought uh, we had sufficient data uh, to get this in just before uh, the summer break. Uh, but then in September, when we're back, we will have um, detailed standalone reports available uh, for both studies. So think of today is a, in effect as a, as a curtain raiser for what we'll be doing in the, in the very early autumn. Um, my name is Simon Osborne. I'm the CEO of IFI Global, which is a research and media business based in uh, London. Uh, we have three publications, which is about to be turned into four, and how ESG will impact uh, the business practices of the fund industry is one of our areas of uh, specialization. Uh, with me on the panel, we have Dr. Bob Swarup, who is a uh, principal at Camdor Global, which is an institutional investor advisory firm uh, based in London and also Sean Wilkie, who is a partner at Greyline, which is a regulatory consulting firm with offices across the US and in London. Uh, Sean is based in their New York office. Uh, we have collaborated with Bob and also with Aminda Dillon, who runs 3SG uh, on the UK research and with Greyline on the US research. And it's worked out from our point of view at IFI Global incredibly well, we're absolutely delighted to have these, uh, these entities as our partners, particularly since it's thanks to them, we've got most of the response that we've had. So thank you all uh, for what you've done. I'm going to uh, give a short presentation on the main findings, and then we are going to get into a panel discussion to debate the results, and also to discuss what they might mean for the development of the fund industry over the next few years. And please do join in. We um, uh, we'll try and take questions as we go along. Just use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. We may also possibly reserve a few minutes formally for questions at the end. We'll just see how we go. So um, uh, before we get into the results, I thought I'd do a few background uh, uh, slides to, 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 to start us off. For those of you who aren't perhaps as close to what's going on, in the uh, on the, in terms of developments of ESG as as some of us are, um, these figures are these numbers are absolutely staggering. We have, um, uh, according to um, uh, the UN institutions, of over seventy trillion dollars now support the UN's principles for responsible investing, which kicked off the whole ESG thing uh, uh, in the early to mid noughties. Um, investment houses with over a hundred trillion dollars in assets under management also supports the UN's PRI. Doubtless, by the way, there's double counting between the top line and the second line there, but nonetheless, um, it's, I, mean, I thought that was an important figure to put up. And Bloomberg Intelligence put out this very specific figure at the beginning of this year for where they forecast assets in ESG to be by the year 2025 of $53 trillion. Of course, it all very much depends on how you count it, what you count, but however you do that, there's one thing that's absolutely uh, for sure, uh, the figures are going up very quickly indeed. And um, the way we look at it, and I think others probably should uh, too, is look at this really like uh, as an investing food chain and how ESG has, development and has developed along the way. Um, as doubtless many of you know, this really all got going with uh, North European pension funds. Uh, Australian superannuation, superannuation funds were very advanced, Canadian funds as well. Uh, they really got the whole process going. Now, institutional investors all over the world are 
very heavily committed to various aspects of ESG, as we all know. Perhaps the most interesting thing at the moment is what's happening on the retail side. Um, it is quite extraordinary how rapidly um, uh, uh, retail investors are catching on to the whole ESG trend. Morningstar reports that assets in European ESG funds passed through the $1 trillion mark uh, last year, and that in the third quarter of uh, 2020, over 40% of all mutual fund inflows in Europe went into ESG products. ESG ETS, which I'm slightly more dubious about, but nonetheless, are also booming. According to Track Insight, they went through the $8 trillion mark earlier this year. And these figures are just passing milestones as we go along. I think perhaps the most interesting figure that I can give you in terms of where we're going is to talk about the intergenerational wealth transfer that we're just uh, beginning to see right now. Uh, Cerulli Associates forecasts that um, $68 trillion will be transferred from um, parents, I, I guess the baby boomer generation of which I'm probably part of, to children over the next uh, 25 years. There are over 600,000 millennial investors, sorry, millionaires uh, in the US already. And that figure is obviously gonna go up uh, very rapidly indeed in the next few years. And the question we should all ask ourselves is, where are these, uh, these young people, people today, I guess in their twenties, where will they be putting their money in the next few years or decades? Are they gonna just want a simple basic return on their, on their investment? Or are they gonna want to try and do something of benefit to the planet, uh, to society as well? Uh, if you think it's the latter, then uh, you would probably be of the view that the, we've got an awful long way to go and we could see substantial increases in asset allocations to various forms of E, S and G funds in the coming years. Moving down the food chain to fund managers, um, and this is something we're obviously going to get into in a lot more detail in a second when we get to the survey results, um, the uh, uh, pickup of uh, ESG practices, and we're not talking about the investing side here, we're talking about um, uh, adopting ESG practices by fund managers, I would contend has been very disappointing today when you compare it with other, com other comparable industries, and we'll come on and talk about that a little bit later. And what I would say to service providers, knowing that there are a number of service providers who are following uh, this e-event today, very simply, I would say it's coming whether you like it or not. So that is um, my quick bit of background. Let me now get into the, uh, the headline results of the research. I, I should make the point that um, we've only taken, I think I partly already said it, we've only taken um, some of the findings, those are the findings, sorry, these are the questions and the results that are comparable in both studies. There are several areas in both that we haven't put up here today because they are only to the US study or only to the UK study. They will be in the separate uh, stand alone reports uh, that we uh, will be coming out with. Um, so as I say, this is just the headline results of some of the findings. Uh, uh, let me start with uh, one of them. Uh, is your organization a member or signatory to any ESG related bodies or standards? So 75% in the UK of the managers who responded uh, said yes. Uh, to a very similar question in the US, the answer was uh, just 12%. Again, in the UK, does your organization have any CSR or corporate ESG policies? 92% uh, uh, said yes in the UK, 30% uh, um, said uh, yes in uh, the US. By the way, I hope you note for those of you in America, for our American cousins, we've butchered the spelling of organization on the questionnaire for our American cousins on the, on the other side of the pond. Um, perhaps also, I, before going on, I should also make um, the point that the UK sample is predominantly from the big global mutual fund complexes. The combined AUM of those is something in the region, Bob, is that $7 trillion, I think you, uh, you said. Um, whereas the, the US has been done uh, predominantly with um, alternative managers, 
uh, 44, 45, I think we said, Sean, um, a second ago, who responded to the questionnaire, and their combined AUM is just under 500 billion. So we have, uh, by luck more than design, we have um, responses from both sides of the pond, but also we have the big mutual fund complexes um, in one part of this, and we have a lot of alternative managers uh, in another part of this. So <clears throat> carrying on, so are you a carbon neutral organization? 25% uh, said yes in the UK, and 7% 7, 7 said uh, yes in the US. Uh, do you have a documented diversity policy? Um, just a little bit, well, very similar figures, interesting um, uh, to, to, uh, to note that, but slightly more in the US said yes, but still the majority in both cases have said uh, yes. Um, will, you diverse, will you diversify your fund boards? 30% uh, in the UK said yes to that. Just 6% said yes to that in the US. And I think the reason why it's only 6%, because the question is somewhat different, as you can see on the screen there. And that's because, as you all doubtless know, in the US, many of these alternative managers will not have, will be partnership structures in the US. They won't necessarily have funds with boards. So um, uh, uh, take that into account when you, when you look at um, uh, that result of just 6%. Um, do you integrate ESG into your investment processes for all investment products? In the UK, the answer was 73%. And again, a very similar result in this particular case uh, with a very similar question. Uh, do you do e our ESG factors uh, part of your investment process? 67% said yes in the US. Um, do you do due diligence on ESG standards? Uh, of organizations that you work with. Um, just 13% uh, said yes so far. I'll come on and say something about that in a second. And then 19% said yes to the question, is ESG a consideration in your due diligence of service providers? Then we asked the question in both studies, very similar question, will you be doing more due diligence, ESG due diligence, on the organizations you work with. And this is the, I think, perhaps one of the most interesting findings of the whole study. 70% uh, in the UK said yes. If you bear that in mind with the previous figure I just quoted, uh, to come back to my earlier comment to the service providers, this is coming your way, whether you like it or not. Um, I was surprised, and maybe we'll talk about this in a few minutes, Sean, um, that there weren't more so uh, managers who answered the US study that said yes to uh, doing due diligence, ESG due diligence on their service providers, just over a quarter, 26% said that they would, they do expect to do more. Um, we'll see how that pans out in the uh, next few years. Will ESG criteria become a, um, a factor in your fund domiciliation decision-making? Uh, there you see it, a third in the UK said yes. And um, this is, I think, a, a subset of the US sample of those that have international funds and therefore are interested in concern with domiciliation. Not all of them in the US would be, for the reasons I was just talking about US partnership structures, etc. But then nonetheless, 26%, which is, um, I think, a reasonably high number, given where we are, said yes to that in the, in the US. So that's the end of the headline findings. I want to emphasize what I said a few minutes ago. This is all going to be packaged up into much more detailed, comprehensive reports, which we'll have ready by the uh, end of August, beginning of September. And you'll be able to uh, see uh, a lot, all this stuff in a lot more detail. I want to quickly mention before we get into the panel discussion, um, we are going to attempt again to uh, do a, um, a uh, uh, study with service providers and follow up to what we've been doing with managers. And these are the questions. I have a colleague, um, of course, Samantha Taylor, who's been in touch with a number of service providers just in the last few days uh, to uh, consult with them on the questions that we should be asking uh, service providers in a comparable study of how they are adapting to ESG business practices. We did something last autumn which was such a monumental failure, it was actually very interesting. We had such a poor response to this, to questions like this, 
when we put it when we put it out last autumn. Um, uh, and I won't name the names, but there were a few service providers, particularly in some of the offshore centers, actually said to the researcher that sent uh, the questions to them, well, why are you sending these questions to us? What, is, what has it got to do with us? And bear in mind, these often firms we know well, and um, we were very surprised at how we didn't expect everyone to be jumping on the ESG bandwagon. We're talking to repeat the autumn of last year, but we did expect to have a slightly better uptake in terms of interest in, in responding to the survey than we actually got back then. So uh, we are either in a brave and sensible way or in a, or in a foolhardy way going to attempt this again very shortly indeed. And uh, we would be interested in hearing from any service providers and the questions that they think we should be asking. As, uh, and as I say, we are doing this consultation right now. Uh, and and uh, quickly before we get into the panel, I want, particularly because we've got a lot of Americans following this uh, event today, I wanted to let you know that we are launching in September a publication for the US market called Fund Structuring International. It's a combined uh, research tool and, and monthly publication providing advice and analysis on uh, international alternative fund industry issues for US managers and advisors covering those topics that are on the screen. Um, and uh, our pitch for this is that at IFI Global, we like to think we know a lot about the topics that are on the screen, but we have no skin in the game. We have no commercial interest in what particular structure any particular manager will take, but we like to think we can help managers uh, at least give them entry level advice in term and unbiased advice uh, on uh, the way uh, they can go. So that is starting at the beginning of September. Finally, back to today, these are the big four questions I think that we should be talking about and the panel will be getting into right now. And, and please do, as I say, contribute to the discussion yourselves. How much will ESG change the fund management industry over the next three years? How much will ESG change senior management and fund board composition? How much will ESG influence service provider and domiciliation selection decisions? And is ESG a passing craze or is it a permanent change? That is enough for me for the time being. And let me now come uh, uh, both to Sean and to Bob and ask them for their reactions uh, to the survey uh, findings. Bob, can I come to you first? What, what comments do you have on, on, on the headline findings that we've released so far? Oh, Simon, well, listen, it's a pleasure to be here as always. And um, before I kind of give my reaction, I think just for the better people in the room, I probably come at it from sort of two or three different perspectives. The first is, as Simon alluded to, I'm a principal at Camden Global, and we do a lot of advisory work with institutions, a lot of insurance, pension funds, and so on. And so therefore, a lot of the asset managers we spoke to were large global multi-jurisdiction asset managers. Um, you know, just a couple of lists of the top 20 or 50. And those are the kind of people who took part in the survey that we were helping out with. The second hat I come at it with is as a partner at Alpha Governance Partners, where, where we provide professional nets to boards, uh, fund boards, amongst other things, as well as fintechs. And, and in that context, you know, for us, ESG is a huge trend that we can see coming intruding more and more into the day-to-day -day job, as it were. And it's something that is a strategic challenge and is important. This is not just about change in society, it's a strategic challenge for business as well. It's something that's out there that needs to be understood. Whether you believe it or whether you don't believe it, whether you accept it or you don't accept it, it doesn't really matter. It's a strategic challenge out there that needs to be considered in the context of your business, because fundamentally, this is about a change in the business environment. Now, Simon, to your, to your kind of survey, my initial thought when I saw that was the stark difference between the US and the UK. I mean, yes, there are differences between large asset managers and small asset managers, but I think there is also a fundamental difference in culture between the US and I would say more broadly Europe, because not surprisingly, a lot of the asset managers that we certainly spoke to were people who were much more, I would say, at least in origins, UK and European asset managers rather than US ones, or there were a couple of them. What I think is that if you want my bluntly honest opinion, this is a passing fad at the moment. This is virtue signaling of the highest degree, where we are all standing there, lifting our skirt up and saying, let's show you all what we've got. This is the Scotsman with his kit on full display. That is what it is, okay? This is marketing pure and simple for most people. 
Because if we're not doing it, we run the risk of missing out on the trade. We run the risk of losing assets. It's about client retention. That is where it all starts. The danger is, is that we also believe that that's all we need to do. Because I don't think it is a passing fad in that sense. You know, the big point I would point out to people is actually don't think of today. Don't think of 2021 and 2022. Think of 2030. 2030 is the first big point at which all the targets that people have set ambitiously for themselves around the world in terms of net zero and carbon reductions and so on, start to come due. At that point, do you honestly believe that when a policymaker wakes up and finds that they've just missed that target by a huge whacking great big amount, the first thing they won't do is turn around and immediately start changing regulation even more to try and drive investment towards the targets that they've missed. We've already seen that happening in insurance land and banking land and elsewhere. I mean, as Simon alluded to, in the UK, pension funds now have to state climate change explicitly into account. In the insurance world, the PRA in the UK has also asked for climate change to be used as a basis for stress tests for insurance companies. It is also part of the firmament now for banks. The Europeans are coming up with disclosure rules. There's SFDR. I mean, we are dying under a wave of ESG and good intentions. But the problem you have is that when you look at that, that is change that is being driven on us. We are not driving this conversation. And when I look at that survey, I see, first, as I said, virtue signaling. The second thing I see is probably people standing there saying, what the hell do I do with all of this? Because there is a real problem. I mean, some of the things in that survey, and I know Simon didn't give you the full detail of that, and that's something we hopefully will cover in September. But when you look at the detail of that, what you see is, even amongst the large asset managers, there is a lot of talk around all the stuff they have. They all have ESG team, they all integrate ESG and so on. But what they actually lack is substance. For example, how many of the ESG people in a firm of any size, small, large, medium, actually have decision-making power and veto power? Much less than you would think. When you start thinking about disclosures, how many asset managers are actually going to disclose material breaches from an ESG perspective to their clients? Not that many. And these are the real problems you have because there is a gap and, and that gap is ultimately what we're trying to contend with because we're right now trying to figure out what this means for our industry in terms of the funds industry. We don't know whether this is going to be something where we simply have to listen to a whole bunch of new regulation and disclosure requirements and so on, which has a frictional drag element to it, or is there something slightly more fundamental? And, and that is the challenge. And that probably starts first and foremost with most people trying to figure out what ESG actually means for them, which is probably the bit of the conversation that no one actually had in most of these firms when they started out. Um, let me pause there, Simon, and then let me pass over to Sean for, for his kind of views as well. Yeah, sure. What, what's your initial reaction to when the survey results? And but I want to before you say anything, I want to emphasize what a great job Grayline has done. We would absolutely no way we wouldn't have begun to have done this without your colleagues and all the stuff that you've done. Uh, so thank you very much. Well, happy to help. I mean, I think this is a meaningful study. It can actually yield very good market color for you know both our clients and a lot of our industry contacts. And I think you know this this type of consensus gathering is, is key to this whole issue. Uh, in a lot of ways, I echo Bob's sentiments in that the U.S. lags, you know, the rest of the, I guess, developed Eastern or Western world by a few years in terms of ESG progression and adoption. Um, you know, I think this study definitely shows that, and I've said this for, for quite a while. But, yeah, I mean, I think the study also showed this bifurcation of virtues and priorities, U.K. versus U.S. I think, you know, U.K. and throughout Europe. I think environmental issues tend to be more of a priority, car being carbon neutral, whereas that's kind of secondary to some of the U.S. priorities that are more focused on social and governance issues, um, which is, you know, I think part of that is in reaction to the current, you know, kind of social conditions that exist in the, the U.S. and, um, you know, a shifting political landscape and a number of other uh, characteristics that are present in today's world. Um, I think there's also what, what the study also showed was uh, a bit of hypocrisy in that a lot of managers are uh, adopting ESG principles and demanding things out of their portfolio companies and, you know, their, all of their investments, whereas on the flip side, there's less corporate adoption at the management company level to also apply these same principles to, you know, further a lot of these initiatives, which I thought was 
was certainly interesting, especially from you know, coming at this from the lens of a service provider. We're getting these questions a lot um, and we, we're adopting a lot of them. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it, it was notable to see that, uh, that discrepancy here. I see when I was um, uh, looking at your website recently, uh, Gray Line is a signatory to the UNPRI. We are, yeah, and uh, you know we've. And what does that involve for you, out of curiosity? So we've had to. I mean, it, it obviously doesn't uh, require quite as much in terms of adopting strategy, you know, and, and adhering to those principles. We put together a framework internally. We have initiatives. We put a lot of time, effort, and and energy into you know diversifying our hiring programs, doing DNI uh, programs, making sure that you know the the E, the S, and the G are getting. Uh, equal footing at, at our level, uh, we're making strides to become carbon neutral, with, you know, an eye towards uh, next year and, and doing so. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we we don't want to <laughs> adopt that hypocrisy where we're helping people with ESG matters. However, we're not making good on those same promises ourselves. Okay, I'm delighted to I'm keep them coming. I'm delighted to see we've already got three questions in from the audience, but before I start looking at those, I want to put the, the following point to both you, both you two, if I may, this is a sort of a few, you, one or two of you may have heard me say before. I think there's an element, just to add on to what Bob's initial comments about um, virtue signaling, I would actually say it's a little bit worse than virtue signaling. I would say there's a big element in the asset management in industry of hypocrisy, because you see at the moment, certainly on the, here in the UK, and I, probably in the US for all I know, a number of asset managers going out and doing the virtue signaling that Bob was talking about in terms of saying, we're only going to, like Goldman Sachs Asset Management said at the beginning of last year, we we're only going to invest in funds, uh, sorry, in, uh, in corporates with at least one woman on the board. Then you look at the fund industry, it's not just them, by the way, it's just one I remember. You, and, uh, and our analysis shows that only 19, as in one nine percent of uh, of the boards of the international funds have women on them. Here in the UK, uh, the uh, FCA mandated fund managers just recently, a couple, less than two years ago, to bring in two independents on their boards. These are the big, huge uh, mutual fund complexes that Bob and Amanda were mainly surveying. Very few of them took the opportunity to refresh their boards and bring in new uh, talent. They brought in their old buddies. They didn't make any real effort to, diet, to do anything that would be uh, according to any of the ES and G criteria, yet at the same time, they're preaching to the corporates, go out there and do this. So it's do as I say, not do as I do. And there's Refinitiv to have a, a DNI index, it stands for diversity and inclusiveness. There is only one single asset manager in the top 100, yet there are many comparable funds with, with funds, uh, companies in there, the KPMGs and the Accentures. So um, how, that's a very long introduction to a question to both of you. How much uh, will ESG actually change the industry? Are we going to get past that virtue signaling that Bob was talking about? Are we going to see the figures quoted in the survey I quoted a few minutes ago going up in the next couple of years? Who, do you want to say that first, Bob? Sure. I, mean, I think, I think let, me, let me start off by defending the industry as much, much as that might shock people. Um, it's not just our problem. I think everyone's virtue signaling. I mean, without pre, pre kind of shadowing the questions you have, Simon, somebody talked a little bit about um, ESG being focused on the private sector. I mean, the big glaring, you know, elephant in the room is sovereigns, right? Nobody quite knows what the ESG rating is for a country at the moment. And that's because most governments don't really want to own up to that particular problem as well. So virtue signaling, I would say, is very rife uh, across all of society, not just um, the fund management industry. I mean, in a sense, what we're doing here is probably the same as everyone else. Um, I think I think the challenge we have is that because people have now decided that this is not, by the way, just about creating a better environment or a better society or a better world. This is also, let's not forget, seen as the way to get ourselves out of a post-COVID kind of you know downturn. Right. This is all about the Green New Deal. This is about you know building back better and all that kind of stuff, right? Frankly speaking, a whole lot of crap on one level, but the reality is that people want growth, and ESG right now is that medium of growth that people have latched onto, and so anybody who ultimately represents a source of long-term capital, which is where the fund industry comes into it, is going to be front and center in that. 
And so the danger we always run now, especially more than ever, is that we may choose to virtue signal, but at some point we're going to be held to account by the same yardstick we're rapidly implementing for everyone else. And that's partly why I go back to saying that I think the most important thing for people to do is to actually start defining what of ESG actually matters to them. Because fundamentally what we have here, let's face it, isn't a bunch of charities, but a bunch of businesses. And every business can only operate insofar as it has margins. Those margins get eroded if we start doing anything and everything under the sun. Because if we start demanding that of other people, at some point it comes back to us as well. And so, you know, if we don't have an action plan, if we don't have a strategy, if we don't have a view on what this all means for us, then frankly speaking, it's going to come back to bite us. And Sean, what do you think? Do you think we're going to see a, a reasonable or a rapid increase in uptake of ESG business practices from the, your kind of clients, uh, the kind yeah. of people that filled in this survey? Yeah, I mean, you know, dollars really uh, call for change. So if allocators are demanding things, yes, I think there's going to, you know, there's, we've already seen this kind of rush towards ESG. Um, but I think we've also seen a progression in what ESG actually looks like. I think, you know, a couple of years ago in the U.S., we saw this very superficial check the box. Hey, we're claiming ESG. Yes, we factor in, you know, these uh, these considerations into our investment process, you know, lightly. Now, I think because there's a level of reporting and analytics being demanded of managers, I think that there's, you know, more thought into adopting a more holistic program. Um, and I think obviously this is on the radar of the SEC as well. So, you know, making sure that uh, managers are living up to their representations and making sure that the, you know, those statements to LPs are factually accurate. You know, I, th I think that's, that's kind of the next, the next phase in this. Um, but I think, you know, as this progresses, I think, you know, ESG as a term, it will go by the wayside. And I think, you know, eventually people are going to look into the underlying more so than just, hey, are you ESG? So looking at, you know, what type of analytics, what's how, how a manager defines their, uh, their ESG program, what's important to them, and then saying, okay, how do, you, how do you foster all of these initiatives? How are you backing them up? So I think, you know, that's kind of the next phase of this. Now there is, you know, there's obviously this inertia that comes out of just business as usual, which, you know, I don't think that there's going to be any rapid uptick uh, where this improves, you know, over the next 12 months, you know, exponentially. Um, but I think it will be more gradual. So, you know, next three years I see is like phase one in this for the U.S., maybe, phase, you know, the three years after that, phase two. And I think we will see, you know, wholesale change in a lot of ways. Um, how deeply rooted that change is, is yet to be seen. Okay, I'm going to come to the first question from the audience. And by the way, for anyone who's like to, please keep them coming. If you want to do them anonymously, obviously, we don't know who it is. and We won't say the name. If you want to give your name and I see somebody has given their name, then when we read out the question, we will do that. So here's one question. Surely, what is more important to investors is the performance of managers' funds, including their ESG funds, rather than how they score on carbon neutrality, diversity, inclusiveness, et cetera. Um, I guess that person is saying to interpret uh, what he or she might be uh, thinking, it's at the end of the day, don't look at how we do it internally, how many people we have of ethnic minorities, women, et cetera, how diverse we are, whatever, what matters at the end of the day is the performance. Who wants to take that first? I'm happy to pick that on one up. I mean, I think, I think, you know, it's a bit of the Benjamin Graham, right? In the long term, you know, the stock market may well be, you know, a weighing machine and the short term is all driven by sentiment. And I think that's the important bit. We're right now in a sentiment phase. You're right, performance matters. But at the moment, it is also about understanding which way the winds are blowing. Um, you know, institutional investors, I think Sean made a very good point about institutional investors driving all of this change. Many of them still have themselves haven't defined what ESG means for them. It's very interesting how last week when the Norwegian government pension fund, which arguably is probably the first major ESG investor in the way people view it, actually rejected the idea of having ESG as part of its investment principles. They didn't want it explicitly in there because they felt it curtailed them too much. And this is the important bit, which is that if you look at a pension fund, and let's just take the Buddha symptom in some ways, the pension fund's first duty is actually to secure members' benefits. 
It is not to make the world a better place. It's to secure members' benefits. If that happens to make the world a better place, that's a nice bonus, but it's not the first starting point. And there is an inherent tension when you look at where dividends come from, as an example, where, for example, in the FTSE, a big chunk of the dividends, the majority, in fact, come actually from mining and tobacco and energy in some form. So, so you know, fossil fuels are still part of that mix. And, and you have plenty of emotive stories. You just Google the web, look at the British Columbia Pension Scheme, for example, where their members asked the scheme to stop profiteering from the blood, sweat and tears of widows and orphans in third world. And you will see immediately lots of people who get very emotional about this, but there is a natural tension there. And, and I think that tension is what we are living through right now. You know, if I was sitting there as an asset manager, performance is important, but to be bluntly honest, there are many managers out there with great performance who are also subscale and will always be subscale because you cannot live off performance. What you live off is good business strategy. A successful business is one that has a good strategy and the strategy means, and if you look at the people jumping in the ESG bandwagon, they're sort of trying to aim for that, right? But actually, I think Sean made a very good point about he doesn't think ESG will survive, and I agree with him. We need to define what it is. We need to find what we are doing in terms of ESG. Because, for example, if you believe that ESG to you is about climate change, then great. Make that central because your client segment that you are targeting is people who also believe that and care about it. I want to see you reflecting that. If, however, you believe that for you, the important thing is the S because it's about inequality or affordability or inclusivity, make that central to your case because that is the client segment that you're gonna work for. You cannot be all things to all people. If you do that, that is not a business. That is a very, very rapid path to irrelevance. And I would strongly recommend people don't go down that path. Sean, have you got any comments on that before we go on? We've got lots of other areas, questions are pouring in, and I've got more questions, but uh, go ahead. Yeah, just, just a quick point. I mean, in the US, um, it's really hard to say, I mean, I think, returns at the end of the day are what's most critical. Um, when it comes to ESG adoption and where that plays into the investment process and thesis, you know, managers and decision makers also have conflicting legal and regulatory obligations as well. So you have your fiduciary duty under the Advisors Act, you have your fiduciary duty under ERISA, uh, Delaware corporate law came in, you know, what are your ultimate responsibilities to LPs and investors and I think, you know, while there's been some guidance around that, it's really not so clear. So in a lot of ways, I think, you know, the regulators and the government could actually dictate how important ESG can be related to their jobs. OK, I'm going to move on to one of the areas touched on the survey. And there's, there is a comment on the Q&A from on, who someone's touched upon this as well, which is on the, on the area of... Um, uh, how ESG might change service provider selection and domiciliation. Um, the way uh, that we have com very comparable questions in both studies. Um, I'd be interested in what you thought of the results we have there and the fact, do you think it's going to change the way uh, people go about their uh, uh, selection of service providers? Uh, will investors want to know that their, the suppliers to the fund managers reach a certain level of ESG business practice uh, uh, in order to uh, want to work with them in future. And on domiciliation, there's, this is a huge question. Will it have an impact upon various jurisdictions? And not necessarily all offshore. I'm going to give you a little story because uh, there may be some people in Luxembourg who I don't offend them by saying this to them. But the one place where investors have really affected domicili or, or weighed in in the last few years on domiciliation, as far as I'm aware, was in the response to the LutzLeague scandal. I haven't got time to get into the whole story. Suffice to say that there was a whistleblower who was working at PwC, leaked a lot of information on the tax affairs, particularly of private equity uh, managers in Luxembourg and others, pharmaceutical companies and all sorts of other firms. Luxembourg was going to put that particular person and his colleague in prison for doing that. And um, uh, a number of uh, institutional investors that are invested in various uh, Luxembourg entities, including a lot of, uh, or a number of Australian superannuation funds said, no, you're not going to do that. We're going to kick up a big fuss. And basically, Alan Del Tour, for some reason, I remember his name, got off with a light uh, wrap across the knuckles, and that was it. So investors are in interested in this. It's not necessarily offshore, but how do you think it might, if ESG continues to develop, as we all, or many of us think it will, how do you think it might affect domiciliation and service provider selection. Who wants to take that first? 
Do you want to go first, Sean? Because you said the other day in our prep call, you haven't seen any effect on Cayman from the US, as far as you're aware. Yeah, definitely not. You know, insofar as the impact of, you know, selecting a, a fund domiciliation, yeah, I think whether there's an exodus from traditional power centers will depend greatly on their willingness to actually adopt to this new normal. Um, I think if they're, you know, reluctant to do so, there could be alternative jurisdictions that pick up a lot of business. Uh, in the U.S., you know, funds have a tendency to just follow, you know, simply follow the path of the you know, more established funds and their predecessors. But I think ESG can be a real, you know, excuse to buck that trend. Um, and if, if a jurisdiction presents a real value proposition for sponsors, I think we could definitely see some attrition. Um, you know, I hesitate to say that there's going to be a you know, major sea change where Cayman is going to you know, no longer buy the, be the domicile of choice, at least because of ESG. There could be other factors that play into that. Um, but that's just how we, we see things now. I'd say from a service provider level, level like I, I said before, um, you know, over the last 12 months, we got exponentially more ESG related questions on things like DDQs and RFIs than we ever did before. So I think that's going to continue to be a trend, even with the managers that we're working with and we're putting together those documents to go out to their vendors during um, you know, the vendor selection process. A lot, increasingly so, managers are saying, hey, we want to ask for you know, these five things or these 10 things to at least get some color as to you know, what the composition of an organization is, what their initiatives are, what their priorities, what their ethos is. Bob, do you want to uh, tackle that as well? What's your view on service provider and domicile selection in, in terms of how ESG is going to impact it? I think it's coming down the curve anyway. Um, I mean, I think to Sean's point, I've seen a lot more ESG questions crop up in uh, RFPs and so on, mainly by the way, may I add, from investors to managers. But bear in mind, the reason why they're actually in the RFP in the first place is because the investor is simply passing the buck to the manager. And at some point, the manager is going to start passing that buck down to their service providers. And so I think you know, it's important. The other thing to bear in mind also is that you know, if you look at some of the offshore jurisdictions, they're in Jersey, for example, being particularly visible, but others as well. I've been suddenly talking a lot more about sustainable business and ESG and things like that. And that's very important because you've got to think of the political dynamics of this as well. I mean, we right now are living in a world where suddenly taxation is back to being a very, very central topic. And, and if you're sitting in an offshore jurisdiction, you know, that falls, by the way, under ESG, perhaps under the S, perhaps under the G, depending on where you want to look at it. But taxation is largely anathema to you. And it's not surprising that if you look at the people who objected to the recent compact, Ireland was one of them. Why? Because this directly impacts your whole economic business model. And so if you're sitting there as an offshore jurisdiction and you desperately want to show that you are, by the way, a good global citizen, you may not be able to do much on the taxation front because that's fundamental to your business model. But what you can do is immediately talk a lot about climate change and biodiversity and all the other bits of ESG. I mean, it's a different old virtue signaling, one might argue, but the point is it is them trying to make sure that they're being relevant to what are very rapidly changing winds of circumstance. Now, most service providers are hostage, not just to their clients, but ultimately to the people that manage jurisdictions they operate within. And so, you know, that ESG piece comes at it from that direction as well. In this country, in the UK and in Europe, a lot of ESG has been driven, particularly recently, not by investors, but actually by regulators who have actually become very explicit about the fact that they will be requiring stress tests, that they will be requiring these things to be worked into regulatory capital models and so on. So, you know, it's important to bear that in mind that as a service provider, this is partly about preparing for what is going to be a shift in the business climate, no matter where you are. The second piece I would argue is, is, again, it goes back to my point about business strategy and good business practice, which is that if you're out there in the, what is, by the way, a very competitive market, how do you stand out? You stand out by making life as easy as possible for your clients. The managers who are doing a good job on ESG win business because they make life easier for their clients. Because those investors can turn around and say, we outsourced it and they're doing a good job. You know, if you can do the same for the managers that you service, then you've done a big part of the job, which is value add. And that ultimately is where ESG comes into the business model. You know, I'm going to do, we are getting, which is fantastic, rapid uh, series of questions coming in. And we, sadly, as always happens with these things, we're running out of time. We've only got a maximum of quarter of an hour left. Sean, I'm going to read three questions that have come in to you, all of which I think are relevant to you. 
If you don't mind, try and take three questions at the same time that have come in. Um, right, try and bracket right. these together. And Bob, if you want to have a go at them afterwards, please do. The first one is, how much difference has the Biden administration made to the adoption of ES3, ESG in the US? Another one is the ESG task force at the SEC was announced as part of regulatory shift under the Biden administration. What are the odds this task force is simply dissolved if a Republican administration takes over in 2024? And the third one isn't quite all about the US, but since you, I don't know how much you know about the SFDR, the question is, neither the UK nor the US are bringing regulations in like the EU's SFDR. Will that change and what happens if it doesn't? You don't have to answer for the UK side, but you can answer for the US side. Do you mind taking yeah. those three head on? All great questions. Uh, in terms of the Biden administration's impact on the adoption of ESG, uh, it's a little bit of chicken or the egg. I mean, I think you know ESG adoption was well on its course prior to the change of administration. Um, I think some of the guidance has given, I guess, given allocators a little bit more freedom to pursue ESG initiatives alongside simply returns. Uh, so I, it certainly hasn't been an impediment. Uh, has it, you know, really uh, bolstered wholesale adoption? I, I don't, I don't know. Um, in terms of the ESG task force, uh, it's it's certainly possible that it could be dissolved if nothing actionable actually comes out of it. If this is just another government agency that doesn't produce meaningful results and, you know, they're simply mining data without any, you know, any doing anything about it, then I don't, you know, I don't, then that agency is going to look just, you know, futile and it probably will be dissolved. Um, of course, you know, if there is a Republican administration, their priorities might be a little different. There are there are shades of gray in all of this. Uh, in terms of SFDR, I think this dovetails well with the task force. I think there will be some reporting. Um, I'm not sure that that's necessarily at the, uh, the investment management space as much as it is the corporates right now. Um, but yes, I think a lot of those reporting mechanisms, I think the U.S. will probably shy away from some of the, I don't know, the, I've said this before, kind of the uh, quantifying of qualitative data. Um, like the SFDR currently kind of does, or at least arguably does. Um, but I'm, I would assume that at some point in the coming years, there will be some type of centralized reporting that takes place. Okay. Um, Bob, do you want to take, take any of those before we move on? I'll, I'll, I'll simply make a, one quick point, which is more progress was made on ESG under Donald Trump than was made under Joe Biden. And that oh, that's a, you're not allowed just to get away with that. So you no, can no, explain no, that no, one, no. please. Let me let me explain this to you. The point is that the politicians in this particular matter are utterly irrelevant. They are playing catch up with what is already happening. I mean, there was an interesting survey result you had, Simon, where you talked about the fact that US and UK managers both actually were broadly similar when it came to diversity policies, right? That's hardly surprising when you consider the huge impact of Black Lives Matters and things like that within the US, right? That is very central to the debate. And if you look around at you know, a lot of businesses in the US over the course of you know, the Trump administration, they were responding to market forces. They were responding to clients that potentially could give them you know, business or not. And ESG had become very central to that decision-making. So you know, that movement towards ESG now is a market-driven movement. It is not a political driven movement in that sense. Regulation is coming into it, yes, but politics, I would say less so. The other thing to bear in mind is that, particularly in the US, I would argue that the task force, et cetera, is irrelevant. I mean, there is something called the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, which is, you know, on the auspices of the UN PRI and like that. There's also the Net Zero Asset Manager Alliance, which is similar. And they're all basically people who decide they want to be net zero by 2050. Now, within the US, for example, under the Asset Owner Alliance, you have CalPERS, you have the Rockefeller Foundation, you have two or three other bodies. On the asset manager side, you have some major US asset managers like MetLife, like uh, BlackRock, others that are members of this. So, you know, they've already signed up to this and they're trying to do it because they're not really interested in just the US. I mean, they're big enough that they care about their global market. And if they do not go ahead and put these things in place, they run the risk of losing business in Europe and other areas like that. So for them, this is no longer just about, you know, will the politics let me get away with it or not? This is actually about very simply, plain and simple capitalist measures, which is can I grow my business or not? And if I do not accept this, 
is this going to harm my business or not? Okay, um, I'm now going to move on to perhaps, I mean, you've already touched upon it, Bob, in your, in your opening comments, but I want to come back to it. Uh, the idea of whether this is a passing craze or something that's uh, enduring and where it's going to grow, etc. Um, uh, and I'm going to read out one of the most of these comments we've had have all been anonymous. This is I'm going to read out her name because she's given her name. Sheena Gordon Hart writes, there is at least one major house well known for being passionate about sustainability that has had to soft close its climate fund. There will be more of that. So back to the question, are we, is this all a, uh, a marketing bandwagon crazy trend or are we still at the foothills of something that will only go away when everything is ESG? And before you answer that, I just in a couple of days ago, I was um, just flicking through various uh, things I was reading. I came, I read a re review of a book called The Dictatorship of Woke Capital, which I think is a lovely name for a book. Um, and um, at least according to the person who was writing the review of it, I've, uh, it was all about how there's lots of inconsistency, inconsistencies on the investment side in ESG, and undoubtedly that's true. But I think that misses the point, and this is what I want to get to with both of you, Sean and Bob, is that this, to me, is a demand-driven activity. First of all, you're responding to pension funds now, to retail investors, family offices, everybody and their mother is jumping on the bandwagon. Um, so in my view, it's not a passing fad because I don't think the demand for these kind of products is going to go away until the world is a very different place from today. Over to you two. Who wants to go first on that? Sean, do you want to have a go at that? Sure. I mean, you know, I, I view ESG as a, as a limiting factor, just like a you know, sector-specific fund, right? If you're only investing in companies that meet your criteria, you're screening out others that don't, you're limiting your investable universe and therefore you're limiting capacity. Uh, and by, you know, by doing that, uh, you have constraints on how much capital you can accept. So yeah, I mean, I think, I think we're gonna see more of this because there, so, there are only so many companies that you know, can be invested in for this principle. So unless the, the corporates are willing to you know, uh, adopt, then I think you, know, you're, you run the risk of getting into, you know, basically washing down returns because there's just nowhere to put that dry powder. So I think that's that's a real factor, and I think that's that's more along the lines of what we'll see, where ESG is just going to be like another one of these, um, you know, investment limits or focuses going forward. Bob, oh, what's your view? Well, you know, I said at the start, I think on many levels it is a passing fad. Now, what I mean by that is I'm not saying there aren't changes in people's preferences and behaviour. But, um, you know, I think Sheena pointed out that there's been a soft skills for climate fund. Well, of course, everyone's piling into something that shows how work they are. And by the way, the fact that they've had to soft close their fund is now going to encourage at least 10 other funds to set up because they can see the investor demand. So, you know, there are very good reasons to jump on this bandwagon. This is the internet craze or whatever you want to call it in that sense. Um, but I think that there's something very important to note here, which is that, you know, when you look at a lot of the support of ESG at the moment, it talks about ESG outperformance and ESG alpha and things like that. If you fundamentally look at ESG stocks as an example, what you will see is this is fundamentally at the moment a momentum trade. People are going into these things because it is right now extremely topical. It may benefit from regulation, it may benefit from societal preference changes, it may benefit from political wins. And of course, the more it goes up, the more it encourages people to go in there. In fact, you can see already, if you look at the green bond market, the number of investors trying to buy green bonds has meant that if you issue a green bond, the spread on that bond automatically is less than the spread on the equivalent corporate bond, de facto, straight away, because of demand. So see, at some point, there's also a counter argument that the returns will eventually end up on the other side. Um, my biggest concern here is that I think the basis of ESG is sensible, which is that we are trying to ultimately create a more long-lived economy out here, which is fundamentally based on self-preservation. And to build into that and to build into your business model makes complete sense for the kind of longevity of your business. However, I think because of the fact that everyone wants to get into it right now, there's a lot of focus. When that focus shifts, as it inevitably will in five to 10 years time into something else, how much attention will still be paid to progressing what is not going to be, by the way, a five to 10 year journey, 
but already from the context of all the targets laid out, is actually a 10 to 30 year journey, right? So my concern is there. My, my biggest concern is what um, the, the philosopher Cicero used to say about the Roman Empire, was that his biggest lament about the Roman Empire was that it always had vigorous beginnings, which unfortunately lapsed as usual into careless ends. And then to me, that's where my biggest concerns of ESG would be. Uh, do you want to have a go at that, Sean, as well? You don't have to quote Cicero in your answer. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, it's, it's you know, well-intentioned, well-intended, um, but just poor execution. Now, I think there are dynamics where, you know, this isn't necessarily a static um, issue. Um, so if there's adoption on other levels, you know, potentially there could be more of a momentum play. But overall, I think, I, I do agree with Bob as to, you know, there is, you know, there's a trade right now that exists. Now, will that also create demand to, for, um, you know, alternative strategies that aren't ESG? Will money pile into that to take advantage of that opportunity? I, I mean, I think it's definitely possible, so. Okay, listen, last question, we're basically out of time. So relatively brief, if you don't mind, gentlemen. In my lifetime, there've been, before this one, two big thematic, investment crazes. Uh, they were both going to change the world. And you could argue both, both of them kind of did to a large extent. The first one was the emerging markets craze, basically around the early to mid 1990s. And then the tech or TNT boom, which in some respects is still going on to, to today. This is in a sense, the third one, I'm sure in my life, in my career, there won't be another one after this. The big difference, and this is what I want to ask you is, do you agree with this comment? between this one and the other two. The other two did not change the industry at all. It was the same investment houses acting in the same way as they always did by the end of those booms. Nothing changed in terms of how they did their business activities. The fund management industry, at least on this side of the pond, is notoriously conservative with a small C, you know, uh, full of the kind of people we all know it's full of. Um, I wonder whether this is what we're trying to get to today, whether this, this thematic investing craze, which is arguably bigger than the other two anyway, is actually going to change the composition and the structure of the business. And very quickly, the European industry is very peripatetic. Everyone has to jump on an aeroplane to do anything because everyone's in a different city or in a different country. The carbon footprint, even of the average ESG fund, is enormous. Is this going to change? Don't all speak at once. You've got one or two minutes left. Okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. I think, Simon, I'd probably disagree with you already on the fact that the first two didn't change the industry. The first two did change the industry because a lot of people made money investing into them and setting up funds and selling funds based around them. So they actually created whole swathes of the industry each time the trend came along. And by the way, plenty of people came along, blew up and died along the way, but they left a legacy in that there was a whole new set of investments there. So, so I think this one does the same, right? I mean, whichever way you look at it, renewables is part of the power infrastructure going forward, right? They're always now going to be renewable infrastructure managers forevermore, the way that were infrastructure managers, you know? So you can see the effect will be there. I think the difference is more the fact that like with all the other crazes we've always had, there are gonna be lots of people who jump on the bandwagon. I think it's only the ones with a clear plan who get through to the other side. Many of them will find that they got on the bandwagon, but they also unfortunately fell off it just before the finish line. Okay, um, Sean, sorry to be asked you to do this very briefly. You got a? Do you think, in summary, do you think this is going to change the way the industry operates in terms of its business practices? I, I think there will. I think how material the impact will be is yet to be seen. I, I think that there are just a lot of uh, unique dynamics in play where you can't just look at ESG in a vacuum, right? You have social media driving all this cultural change. You have possibly another tech boom operating in parallel with this ESG hysteria. So I think, you know, there are a lot of events that play into this. Um, I think there will be some change. How, how drastic that is, is up in the air. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, uh, for following us. And, uh, and, and uh, also very much to Sean and to Bob. To repeat what I said at the beginning, the full reports will be ready at the other end of the summer. Have a uh, very good uh, rest of the day and a good summer break. And we will be back with much more of this stuff come the autumn. Uh, bye bye, everybody. Hopefully see you then. Uh, great to be here.
See you, bud. Thank you, everyone.